I think in this life you come across a few people that really, really change your life and influence you. And I'd have to say Chong Lu is definitely one of those. But the flavour is entirely different. So you yeah. can, people can tell the two different, you know. When I met him, I was really nervous. I expected this really intense, serious guy. And the first thing that struck me was his sense of humour. I thought I knew how to cook. But from day one being in his kitchen, I realised I had a lifetime of learning ahead of me. And what amazes me is not a day goes by where the guy doesn't come up with either a new dish or teach me something new. Over the years, our relationship's changed. I'm no longer his meat chef, but I still really look up to the guy. Hi, Hi Sammy. How are you? Good. He's always got time. If you've got a question, the guy's an encyclopedia of food knowledge. I'm going to fry it all up, and then I'm going to steam it with some roasted garlic. Chong was the guy that kind of brought classical yeah. cookery and Asian food together. So I'm going to fry this eggplant. With he not only created a new cuisine, but he's light years ahead of anyone I've worked with. The three main things I learnt from Chong are respect for good ingredients, balance or harmony of your overall dish, and that technique is everything. This is my grandma's dish. He's inspired so many chefs and he's left a trail of people behind him that have all done great things and that is the measure of a great teacher. It brings everything together. Oh, mate. Oh, this is great. I envy you having that time with Chong. Well, I feel privileged. You know, you have these periods in your career, don't you, where you just learn a lot. And I'm going back to a period in my career today um, when I was learning at, at TAFE and they taught us how to make a veal cordon bleu and it's got a real <laughs> bad name, but I, I kind of like... It's a it's down, trip down memory lane for me, Maggie. So, but I think I can do better than TAFE because I've got, for my cordon bleu, some absolutely beautiful milk-fed veal. I'm going to trim up this portion here. This is a problem area down here because um, you do have some fairly heavy sinew, so I'm going to actually take this off and, and use it in my glaze because that, that piece down here is, is, is hard, hard going. It all happens like very easily where it's meant to come apart. You know, like, that's just a gentle and I should be slashing along with my knife as well, but I'm trying to make the point that, you know, it'll, it'll come where it's meant to come. And that's good stock stuff, that's fine. There's still a bit of meat and flavour and if you want to be really economical, you can take that little bit off. I learnt a lot about meat on Chong's meat section. I was on that for a long time and you have to do everything yourself. And he wanted you to butcher so mm. that when you were cooking for that night, it was your product, you knew how, where it came from, from Step one. How lucky you were. Yeah, well, I resented it at that time. Really? No, <laughs> this no. This is but, too hard. I mean, that, that is a privilege to, to have such an education. You look back and you just think, wow, that was a time in my life when, you know, I was learning so much on such a, a quick scale. But at the time, you just feel like you were working your guts out. <laughs> which you were. <laughs> which, which, yeah, which was what was happening. Yeah. My initial reaction when I started doing this dish at, at school was, why can't I cut it that way? Because I'll already have the shape I want. But it's the grain, so you can see I've cut across the grain. And then... And, and what a beautiful texture it is. Oh, this is, yeah. this is actually really so, good piece. Yes. So now I'm going to make a paillard. And... Why do you call it a paillard? Oh, it's just a posh way of saying a smack down thing, isn't it? Now, I'm aiming for about six millimetres thick, and that's based on my experience of... I like to take veal exactly to medium. So I just put two pieces of black forest ham, and that's the honey-cured one. So that's, that's a nice little bit. And I've got some beautiful fontina, and it is a nice bit of cheese, isn't it? Mm. So I think this will work and quite well. And why do well. you choose Fontina? I, don't know, I was thinking gooey. I was so thinking, it'll melt. Yeah, and I yeah. was thinking flavour because quite often mm. veal can lack a, a little bit in flavour. And I was lucky today. I didn't. I think this will have flavour. So a bit of salt and pepper, and I'm going to go a little bit higher on the salt. And then the only problem is 
while it's frying, it tends to ooze out. Ooze out. <laughs> so I've probably got to learn my lesson oh, here. So, yes. Now, that's my little basic package. OK. And hopefully I've got enough edging here that the cheese won't ooze too much when I'm frying. So I've got an egg and some water. Well, then you want tongs, cos I remember what you taught me. I'm, I'm not going to follow <laughs> what, I taught, what I said, though, Maggie. Not when gonna... I was making such a mess the other week. <laughs> I'm going to do it your way and crumb my fingers. <laughs> Um, I like to get I'm really a... <laughs> pleased about that, I've got to tell you. <laughs> so there's my little package, and then pop flour first, pop him in the egg wash, and then really gum the breadcrumbs around, try and get all of those edges covered. And then set him up. Thanks, Maggie. And pop him in the fridge. So that's me, Maggie, but what are you up to? Well, I wanted to do rabbit because I'm going to do a scallopini of rabbit and... Um, that's, see, that's a fancy way uh, well, of saying it. Yes, yes, I could just say flat rabbit. <laughs> um, uh, but the thing about rabbit is you can buy it as the whole animal, you can buy it as just the saddle, and if you do, ask to make sure that the kidneys are attached, which this is my favourite way. Yep. But these days you can also buy it just the fillips. I didn't okay. even know you could buy it like this. Yes, you can. But what's so great about this is that silver that you talked about has already been taken off. So... Geez, they're spoiling you a bit. They, here, they, they are. But in case that you have bought the whole rabbit um, or bought the, the saddle, which is so beautiful to bake, I'm going to take the fillets off for you. And so it's the knife down the spine here and just run the knife along. Farmed rabbit is beautiful and moist and tender and much more forgiving than wild rabbit. Can you see how I'm using my knife to sort of really push it along there and see how really easily it comes off? I'm just using my knife to kind of roll it away. That is easy. Whoops. I'm going to bash these out. Now I'll, I'll put them top to toe and bash the two of them together. Don't bash it so hard that you're going to break all the tissues down, by the way. There's a line where all of the fibres start to break, isn't That's there? That's exactly right, and I don't want that to happen. OK. So at this stage now, I'm merely going to put some... Um, marjoram, I've lovely sweet marjoram, and I just want it to sort of sit on the top of the skin there, on both sides, and then just before I cook it, I'm going to put it in some seasoned flour. And I'm going to leave them in that position until I'm ready to cook. But okay. I want some more fresh herbs. Well, I'm doing a herb sauce, so... Well, I'm going to do herbs and olives Are with you? my sauce. OK, yes. well, we'll see how we front up for this one. OK. Visiting my local herb garden in spring is such a treat. The colours and aromas, they're just wonderful. Even though I grow a lot of my own herbs, I love to visit someone who is a professional and has so many at their fingertips. Well, the rosemary certainly does. My favourite herbs it. are definitely flat leaf parsley, rosemary, and thyme. Mm. But I love the smell. They suit my very casual country cooking style and they grow like weeds in my Mediterranean climate. The best time to pick herbs is in the cool parts of the day and just before you need them. Fresh herbs and the fresher the better. They give a much more vibrant flavor than that of dried. They just add that other dimension. Nothing quite like all the fresh herbs of spring. Mm. I mean, herbs go the whole year round, but these beautiful blue flowers you get in spring, I love them. They, they do taste like cucumber, you're right. Oh, the borage flowers, oh, yes. Brilliant. What do you plan to do well, with them? Well, I'm going to put herbs in my sauce. I'm going to put um, lemon thyme and marjoram, because I've already got marjoram in the first stage. Yep. Um, so that, and I might use some chives, but I don't know. OK. What about you? Well, I wanted to actually do tarragon in my sauce, but I'm going to do a a herb sauce as well, yes. and I'm going to use this lot. I'm going to use chervil, um, chive and some dill and some parsley, a real freshy sort of sauce, a clean-up. 
So show me, show me the way. Well, I've got um, some shallots I've already um, sweated off. I'm going to put the lemon thyme in. Uh, and oh, that was the marjoram, my glasses are off. <laughs> <laughs> the, the marjoram and the lemon thyme. And I'm going to use olives too, because I love yeah. rabbit and olives. Now, I've got enough heat there to deglaze the pan. Now, you could use wine, verjuice, whatever you want to. And then I'm going to put the stock in, a brown chook stock. And it will just cook down until I'm ready uh, to put the olives in. So it's over to you. All right. Well, I've already got a reduction. So what you're doing there is sort of being covered. So um, this is a veal glaze. And this is a good quality veal glaze field glaze it's got no no sugars no rubbish in there there would have been a bay leaf and some thyme in the actual stock so my hard stuff's done my hard work's done I'm cheating I'm being lazy so all I've got is some shallot for a little bit of sweetness I guess white wine and some veal glaze some butter some lemon juice just to freshen it up but I'm gonna leave my herbs here because they're gonna be a last minute throw in off the heat Okay, so I'm just going to bring my little sauce tray over and I get really grumpy at my sauce chefs if they don't have all of their stuff on plus and by that I mean handy because you, so, you know they should have shallot, garlic, butter, lemon juice, white wine, all their herbs because if a customer asks for you know a specific sauce and you've got everything they can turn anything into everything so I like to have all of my little gear on plus. What I love about the restaurant is if a customer says, oh, I want a pepper sauce, Madagascar, yeah. you've got it all there, you've got everything ready. Or someone says, I can't eat chilli. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. But, and you can have it all handy. Yes. I like to cook the pepper in the butter a bit, so oh, it carries. Do you? Yeah, I like okay. that. Um, and that's just a personal thing. I like the smell. I think it's more psychological. It's than very <laughs> aromatic. It is, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> Quick deglaze with white wine. And now I'm going to pop my glaze in. And this is a good one. This is a nice glaze. You know, that's the sort of glaze that you could almost eat with a teaspoon yeah. as, a, as a kind of a snack. It's beautiful. Well, yeah. <laughs> there's the cake bowl, Maggie. OK. Um, and but all I, I do here mm. is I've put the glaze into the shallots and the white wine. And the balance should be about right, flavour-wise. What's going to be missing is probably fatness on the palate for me for this particular dish. Um, when I monte or add in butter, I go on a lot of different things. Gloss and the viscosity, keep it moving. This adding of the butter, the monteing as you call it, is really velvets the sauce and oh, enriches yeah. it. I'm about right, I reckon. A bit more gloss, a bit more viscosity. And then I'll have a quick taste and see if I need the lemon juice. It, it will take the lemon juice, definitely. All of it. So I'm going to set that aside. I'm happy with that. So okay. I'll pop him on the back burner. Mm -hmm. And this is clarified butter. The butter's basically a whole block of butter's sat over a double boiler and I've let the milk solid split out. And the beauty of that is it will take some temperature. Basically, I'm trying to get some temperature into the oil and there's a few milk solids in there and they're going to burn a little bit because this is taking a lot of heat. You could do this in oil. In olive oil would be yeah. nice. All right, so I've got my little veal parcel. He's been chilled down. So I pop him in there. And now I could cook this all the way through in the oil, but I'm just going to get my breadcrumbs browned, get the whole thing sealed up, and then pop it in the oven for three or four minutes, I reckon. OK. I should have a beautiful gold there now. I can tell you have. That's good. Lovely. And you will notice I did the, the flat side first and got a good seal on the edge. Yep. Um, I reckon the oven should do the rest for me. I've got enough colour there, should be okay. Um, the veal should be at the stage now where it's probably rare. And I'll just pop it in to a fairly warm oven to get it the rest of the way. Well, that gives me time to do my rabbit. I've lightly floured it and into some nut brown butter. Have your butter hot before you start. So often I find people overcook rabbit. And it's such a shame. It's a sweet, moist meat. But we, we do have a tradition of um, cooking it too far. I think maybe because males like, took over the role of cooking rabbits. Do you reckon? Uh, it was, don't you reckon a lot of guys cook rabbit and they uh, think, oh, I know how to cook rabbit. No, no, the number of people that have told me that their mum cooks it for three hours. Yeah. And, and slow cooking, that's fine. 
Now that is all the cooking that needs. About a minute and a half either side. I'm going to rest those while I cook the liver and the kidney. It's such a clean liver yeah. and it's got to be cooked until it's um, just caramelised both sides and it's just quite wonderful. Now the sauce I'll bring back to a rapid boil. I've got about a tablespoon of olives there. So I'm all ready to serve. Well, it's looking good. But I pretty might quick. get my gear out too. Okay. And I'll meet you over there. Now I'm putting my sauce on the base because I like the freshness of, of the rabbit to not be covered over with sauce. And the beautiful liver, absolutely beautiful liver and kidneys. And I think I need some of your chives. Can I pick yep. some? Ah. Oh. I just needed that, um, lots and lots of fresh herbs, and there we go, I'm, okay. I'm done. For my beef glaze, or veal glaze, I should say, big handful of herbs, and then... You ready? I'm ready, yeah, I'll nap okay. that baby over. I don't need a lot, because it's uh -huh. so strong, and it's lightened up the veal. The white wine and the butter's lightened up the veal glaze, because that would have been tending towards a beef-style sauce, so I've managed to lighten it up. And that's it. So hope I got the cooking right. So do I. <laughs> I'm interested in rabbit, olive and sauce combination. I'll leave you with the <laughs> livers and kidneys for what now. Yeah, sorry Maggie. Oh. The meat is really sweet. It's not dry, it's a little bit gummy. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's all about that quick cooking. Yeah. And that bit of flour, as you said, that flour keeps all those juices in. All right, well, I'm going to cut this and just see how we went. And it's being revealed as we speak, and I hope it's cooked right. Yeah, look at that. It's, it's pretty good. The veals could have taken a bit more. But it'll be just as I like it. Yeah. It'll be perfect. Let's Can I? give it a shot. That's working for me. It's really good. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I like it. I, I'm happy. I'll give it a blue ribbon. <laughs> so will I. <laughs> Thank you. Inspired by Patty. This is so right up my alley. As she explores the fantastic food and culture of Jalisco. I'm giving you your first recipe. Patty's Mexican Table. Weeknights 5.30 on SBS Food and On Demand. What? Chris Brown will learn. A bar fight over a bet on a horse race. You can't choose your ancestors. Charged with murder. Who do you think you are? Tomorrow 7.30 on SBS and On Demand. Today, one in six Australian children are growing up in poverty. Children are the future um, of any nation. So when children get the support that they need, they can get out of poverty. Every child deserves every opportunity to succeed. Not having the right shoes to wear or the same uniform as everyone else, not having the ability to go on the excursion makes children feel that they're not a part of a school environment. It must be so soul destroying to just see your kids not getting what everyone else has. Sponsorship with the Smith family can change a child's life, but we urgently need more sponsors. Education is the circuit breaker. Education breaks that poverty cycle. Sponsorship gives children practical, emotional and learning support to get the most out of their education. Call 1-800-434-092 or go online. So I would say to somebody, Become a sponsor. Make a difference. <coughs> a chesty cough is disruptive for the whole family. Help switch off your cough with Duratus. Its double action formula breaks down mucus and clears chest congestion. Get Duratus for a great price every day at Chemist Warehouse. Across New South Wales, one in three people count on NRMA insurance. Including the house at number 12. From Goulburn to Gunnedah, New South Wales chooses NRMA Insurance. Daddy, what a wonderful thing! I first met Stephanie Alexander over 20 years ago. Don't be cheeky! <laughs> Come in for our spring sunshine. Oh, what a great garden. It's just grown so much. Some of our beautiful cross lettuces, which are really fantastic. Stephanie is passionate about the issue of children learning 
to grow food, to make compost and to cook and to sit at the table and share and in doing so add to the joy of those children's lives. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, we'll have all of those for lunch. The kids love to be part of it. I'm afraid we've got slightly collapsing. There is no doubt that our shared passion for food is very much part of our friendship. Stephanie and I, when we cook, we love to use up the leftovers, but no one quite like Stephanie. No one ever. Our first meeting, she invited me to come over to see how a real kitchen was run and seeing the frenetic activity like a whirling dervish. It was an amazing thing. Remember this from Italy? Cavallonero. Cavallonero. Both Stephanie and I had food-focused families. <laughs> Five minutes to go. It's very much the heart of where we both come from. As a chef, as an educator, as a writer, Stephanie has influenced contemporary Australian food in so many ways. My friendship with Stephanie, both professionally and personally, is a really important part of my life. I've always known it was going to be great, but this is more than I ever expected. See? <laughs>
And I like it with a little bit of paprika. I don't know why. Is Can't. that the sweet paprika, that's, that sweet yeah, smoky? Yeah, that's the sweet it's one. Do you fantastic. like it? Fantastic, yeah. And I give it a little bit mm. of lemon. And I think I've been hanging around with Maggie a little bit too long here <laughs> because I'm going to gloss it up a little bit. <laughs> and that's it. And are we going to wait for that to cool? Yeah. OK, so yeah. I can go on with yeah. mine? Yeah. Well, this is simple versus simple. If you're going to make a bruschetta, normally I wouldn't oil it first. But for this one, I'm going to. But here, what I've done is I've cooked the broad beans off. I'm going to let them cool a little bit because I want to put extra virgin olive oil through them. And it's got to be a good bread. It's your good bread, I think. Is it? Yes, sourdough. And it doesn't have to be sourdough, but it has to be um, a rustic loaf. Not, yeah, not no um, fairy bread here. That's right, no yeah. fairy bread at all. I want the, that grill mark, but I want it to be quite toasted all the way through. Yeah. Now, I choose pecorino, but it could be parmesan. It could be goat's curd. It could be a, a lot of different things, but it's the saltiness. Yeah. I find they need salt. Whether it's cold yep. or hot, um, they really need salt. Okay, that's all I need. Just that nice toasty, toasty look. And now here, these have cooled down just that little bit. So quite a lot of mint, some oil, and just toss it all around. And serve it piled really, really high. I mean, this is about peasant food and just making the most of simple, simple ingredients. Bit of pecorino and... Bit more, bit more. Do you know, Maggie, I would order this off a menu. You can go for it. All right, so good work of the pecorino. Mm. Mm. I eat that. Mm -hmm. oh, good. Mm. Have a little bit of a dippy. See what you're I don't need my spoon. The potato in it really does give it a, a round about feel. That's the mm. way I could mm. I couldn't explain it, mm. and I don't really understand it. And the basil, why, but it, it it does it broadens it out. Well, I'm going back for more. <laughs> well, it's simple, but it's nice to do simple. Ah, oh, simple is good. It's mm. having the confidence to be to be simple about food. I agree with that. I'll drink to that. Shall we drink to it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was waiting. <laughs> And to everyone that gave you the confidence to do that. Exactly. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah.